Welcome to the AusAsia Business Program with your host, Stacey Martin. Stacey brings together experts, ideas, and information on how to navigate business opportunities in Asia. And uh, welcome to the AusAsia Business Program. I'm Stacey Martin, and in the studio today I have Andrea Plawitsky. Is that how you say it? Andrea Plawitsky. So, Andrea is the Director of Australia China Tourism Connections uh, with Amplify Me. So, welcome to the show, Andrea. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Um, so, Andrea, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you were born, and how you developed this interest in international markets. Well, I've always lived a pretty international life. As you'll hear over the course of the interview, I'm actually Canadian originally. Right. So, I grew up in a French and English environment、wow. with a Ukrainian background. <laughs> Um, so, adding to that, I developed a love of China when I was about 12 and was very fortunate to be able to go and sort of live that experience through university when I was 18 and so 19. So, you did your university in China? I did a semester of university in Eastern China back in 30 years ago now. Well, so, 1988. It was pretty unique back then, wasn't it? It was fantastic and it really set the stage for the direction that I went after that. So, after China, I spent some time in Thailand. Uh, went back to Canada and did a business degree, an Asian and master's, and then back into Thailand as well. So, my background through Asia, I spent about seven years between China and Thailand together. Wow, that's amazing. Certainly back in those days, I mean,、um, there's, there's a number of students, Aussie students, studying in China now, but back then, wow, it must have been、uh, amazing. How did it, you get around with the language? And- well, learned very quickly. Didn't have the hesitation that I do as an adult to speak it, so <laughs> I didn't get embarrassed.、Um, I also found a beer always tended to make everyone a little bit more fluent and、of、fluid. <laughs>、um, but it was a very interesting time. It was the time of the foreign exchange currencies, so、yep. we were changing money on the black market. It was still the time of the Mao suits. So it was a very traditional China、mm. that I saw back in '88, and over the years that I've been involved with the country, I've seen it progress into the modern. Cosmopolitan metropolises that it is nowadays. Yeah, it's quite amazing, particularly today when you see the contrast between old and new, but also to look at the history and, and, and why、Absolutely. they do things the way they do,、uh, particularly in business. Back to your degree, you did a degree in marketing you, 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 and got into that marketing field, PR and so on.、Uh, what were your learnings、uh, in, in that sector? And how that, has that part of the career sort of shaped your view of things today? Well, when I first came to Australia, I was a little bit, I'd actually been doing business development in, in Thailand in the potash mining and realised、wow. that fertiliser was not for me.、Um, fell into a, an opportunity to work in marketing、um, and realised quite quickly that I actually do enjoy, I have a gift of the gab and I do enjoy. I've noticed、um, that, yeah, <laughs> we could chat for hours. <laughs> Absolutely.、Um, to be able to, to sort of try and. Share stories with people. The storytelling side, I think,、okay. is what really, what really、um, stuck with me, which is why the PR. But I was particularly fascinated when it came to the travel side of things.、Um, whether you used Pantene or you used another Unilever product,、yep. I wasn't that interested. But、okay. where you were going and actually、um, helping influence people's directions of where they traveled and how they traveled and the cultural experiences they had was what I found I had a real passion for. So I spent almost 15 years doing travel and tourism PR. Right. Which helps you really understand the sector as well. So, I've been very fortunate to work from tourism boards all the way through to accommodation providers, through to、uh, regional events. I spent a long time working with regional operators across Australia. And I think the insights that you get from that is there's everybody has a story to tell, and there's actually a unique aspect to every business. But sometimes uncovering those nuggets and those gems are really difficult. One of the things I've found when I have travelled to Asia, generally on a, a business、um, trip or a business mission,、uh, and there's a lot of、um, camaraderie with the other people on the mission. But when I've then stayed on, and I'm fortunate to stay with、um, friends over there or other, other connections, that you know, you really ingrain yourself into the culture and you learn way more than. Staying in a hotel and, and those insights that you get on the ground, it is quite incredible. But obviously, you love travel because you've moved around the globe quite a bit. So, you've made tourism your focus for business now, is that right? Absolutely. So, I've been involved in probably almost entirely wholeheartedly in tourism for about 17 years now.、Okay. But my mum would say that at the age of two, I had my suitcase packed and ready to go. <laughs> so, it's been in my blood ever since I was born.、Um, I think for me, Travel particularly helps open up the world to people. The whole cultural 
um, getting to know each other. Exactly like you say, it's one thing to be in a hotel overseas. I think business trips can sometimes be a bit overrated. Yep, yep. You're actually working all day, trying to do business meetings at night, etc. You often don't get the chance to see places. It's that post-trip that where you really get the cultural immersion and you can really enjoy a destination to its fullest and doing it with the benefit of family or friends who live in a place yeah, and yeah. who can be your hosts and can give you insights that you don't get from a guidebook. That's where the real joy comes oh, out of absolutely. travel. Absolutely, And uh, it's interesting having, you know, people trying to get approval through their business to say, hey, I want to go on this trip. It's a little bit hard to say, I'm just going to go for an extra few days just to see what comes up. But what I've found uh, on some of the business missions But that's is where the magic happens. Exactly. It's amazing because people will say, yeah, I've met you. Let's catch up again. And yeah. then you get catch up again after that because they want to introduce you to someone or, or show you their premises. Um, and that's when, you know, often the most valuable um, business meetings happen happen and And I think we tend to fill our days and perhaps not also recognize that sometimes getting around in another country can take a little bit longer than the short and it's actually where the relationships happen and business in Asia is very much around relationships and that initial meeting at a trade show or that initial meeting that you have is very formal but that's not where the business is going to get done it's over the dinners it's meeting the family it's getting out and understanding their culture and actually going in and seeing a place gives you so many more insights into your potential consumer as well it's one of the things i always say to operators is go and see china go and feel it for yourself go and get a sense of what it's like on the ground understand your consumer we spend a lot of time and do a lot of research as brands trying to talk to our consumers domestically we invest huge amounts of money in research and yet we don't take the time to go and see our overseas yeah potential clients look, in their own home places there's only so much desk research you can do right? Absolutely. in my financial services career I dealt with Aussie expats and it was only uh, about six seven years ago when I started going to Hong Kong regularly you know I was walking through the city on a Sunday there's all these people having a picnic what's that about and it's maids day off all the expats have um, home helpers and in fact if you don't have one you're considered you're not giving someone a job so it's quite important but uh, they congregate on a Sunday and having dealt with expats for 15 20 years I had no idea so yeah. until you see it on the ground um, the other interesting thing was um, Simon Kayu Lee who I know you work closely with as well uh, arranged on our trip in January to go into um, people's homes in Shenzhen which was amazing bringing delegates in there to see how they live having an afternoon tea with them they were asking lots and lots of questions from Australia so as you say rather than just reading the research yeah it is totally seeing your things for yourself and that was such a privilege and I've heard the feedback from the delegates on that trip and that's always been what's the first thing they talk about is those homestay trips those yeah. those interesting visits with the families because that's where the insights are gleaned as you say it's not from I can give you all the statistics in the world that Tourism Australia and all the other STOs have done in terms of the research and while they're valuable and they have a role and the government needs to provide them the real nuggets the real gold magic and insights comes from getting to know people and that it could be a throwaway comment that becomes the aha yeah, moment absolutely. so for example with Simon we've traveled around the New England area of New South Wales together for a client and he was looking at the poplars and he said oh there's a beautiful Chinese poem that talks all about poplars that's where the marketing should yeah, be focused yeah. That sort of insight we could not have got from a no. book. I would never have known that. You would never have known that. That that purely came from his local knowledge of being Chinese. And, and that's the power of um, partnering with experts. So we've seen a huge increase in the number of um, tourists to Australia. Tell us about that and what's expected going forward. Well, the numbers have been phenomenal, as you say. Um, we're up to officially... The Chinese inbound market is larger than our Kiwi counterparts now. So they right? surpassed them about a week ago in terms of official statistics that came out. Um, predictions are anywhere up to about 3.3 to 3.6 million Chinese tourists will be coming to our shores by 2026. So the numbers are phenomenal. And what we're seeing is a maturing of the market. So we're still going to see the group markets from secondary destinations um, the second, third, fourth tier cities out of China. So for our listeners, the main cities are obviously Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Guangzhou. Shenzhen, starting to be Chengdu, but you're seeing more people from second tier cities starting to travel. Chengdu still counts as a second tier city, although it's catching up in the first tier qualifications. But we're starting to see them from the northeast, from places like Dalian, we're seeing them from Chengdu, we're seeing them from Chongqing, a whole range of, of sort of the next tier down of cities 
in terms of size and in terms of economic scale. And the travel cycle that we see is travelers come and they we do the same thing. So it's it's quite an understandable cycle. But they start out by traveling on a group tour to build the confidence and get to know the destination at a, quite a superficial level. And that's where all the icons are important. Could you imagine going to Paris and not seeing the not Eiffel seeing the, Tower? Yeah. <laughs> so it's exactly the same thing for our inbound tourists. They come to Sydney and they see the Harbour Bridge and they see the... Um, Opera House and they go up to the Great Barrier Reef and they go down to Melbourne and they see the Twelve Apostles. Those are all things they have to do. But then the next trip they come and they start to delve into a little bit more detail and they go on self-driving. Okay, well I'd like to really talk about this self-driving opportunity. We'll take a break now. So you've been uh, listening to Andrea and got some tremendous insights into um, the tourism market and we'll hear a little bit more about that uh, after the break. Asia is taking a short break. If you'd like to sponsor this show or be part of Eagle Waves Radio, go to our website, eaglewavesradio.com.au and contact us. Hey Tess, don't you employ overseas staff and you've been thinking about expanding your business offshore? Yeah, I have been. And you have investors that are also considering moving to Australia. I do. So a registered migration agent could probably help you with the right visa solution. But how do you find the right one? Industry Body Migration Alliance has over 4,800 registered agents. What's the best way to contact them? Email help at migrationalliance.com.au and you'll find a Mara registered agent right near you. Cool. And now, back to you, Stacey. Well, welcome back. I'm in the studio with Andrea Palitsky, and uh, we're talking about uh, all things China tourism today. So there's been a fairly recent increase in the number of uh, direct flights between Australian cities and Chinese cities. Uh, I guess that's really fueling some growth as well. Absolutely, and it's really exciting because it's starting to come into cities that haven't seen as strong uh, a Chinese okay. visitation. So Adelaide, Perth, there was an announcement that there's new flights coming into the Gold Coast and Cairns okay. as of Mar- uh, May this year. So we're up to eight different um, ports of entry into Australia and there's over 190 flights a week coming to Australia wow, now since the opening yeah. of the uh, Open Skies Agreement. Oh, fantastic. So that's making it easier for people to get here. Um, and, and it's helping them disperse. So rather than having to come to Sydney and then deciding they want to get yep. to Perth or they want to get to Adelaide, it's really giving some of those other cities across Australia the chance to tap into this market. And, of course, Perth is on the same time zone as a lot of Asian countries, so yes. that uh, makes it uh, quite easy. So just going back, I'm interested to know, as we started to see uh, tourists coming from Asia and China, how did the early tour operators kind of adapt their offering? So the early tour operators are still actually um, attracting the, the package market. Okay. But what we're seeing is the independent traveler, the free and independent or FIT as we like to say in the industry, is starting to explore beyond what the tour operators are providing. So they're actually heading out on their own into regional areas. Some research that was done recently by a colleague of mine found that they went to 84 different towns across Australia. Is that right? So they're not just staying with the itineraries that we've given to them. So we're yep, seeing yep. a lot actually explore along the Great Ocean Road, but all the way through to Adelaide now. And others are doing the drive between Sydney and Brisbane and stopping in the little towns along the way. So it's opening up an opportunity for a lot more Australian businesses to get involved with this market. So what you're saying is, you know, people typically would see the icons, whether it's the Eiffel Tower uh, <laughs> in France or the Harbour Bridge in Sydney, but, but it's really more about, like, coastal. I mean, the beaches here are world-class, obviously, wildlife it's that they don't see. Coastal, wildlife, nature food and wine are the real key drivers for the Chinese market. There's a very small proportion that come out for sports tourism. So, okay. for example, the Gold Coast Marathon has started to see a lot of Chinese participants. And, of course, Aussies go over for the new AFL in Shanghai. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's a two-way street. Yeah, so yeah. there are niche interest markets that go both ways. And you talked earlier about immersing yourself in the culture when yeah, you go to absolutely. China. The same sort of thing. I know of Chinese tourists who are traveling the world looking at World Heritage Sites. And that's their prime focus, why they travel. So it's not one homogenous market. It's actually a lot of people with a lot of different individual interests. So there's going to be increasingly a market for bird watchers, a market for hikers, a market for those who want to camp, a market for those who want to come and run a marathon, and a market for those who like to come to the cities and try 
different cuisine and culture and a market for those that want to go and pick their own abalone down in Tasmania yeah, and then actually yeah. grill it or whatever they do with and, it. And, and of course the Chinese have a strong love of food. Mm, um, they spend absolutely. quite a lot of food and a very celebratory um, food in China. So when they come down to Australia, a lot of the things they found is a real delicacy are things we eat day to day, right? Well, they like a lot of things like the seafood that we've yep, got. I yep. think our seafood is one of the biggest drivers for Chinese from a uh, food and wine perspective. They also like um, the quality of our produce, the clean, green, and knowing where it's coming from. Yeah, so absolutely. that whole provenance, um, being able to share on your restaurant menu where the food is from is really mm-hmm. important. But they're not as big on a whole big plate of food. So one thing we need to remember is they come from a very sharing environment and a community where most of the food is put in the middle of the table and shared. Yeah, and look, it's quite interesting because, you know, like most Aussies, I grew up in meat and three veg. If you put that in front of a Chinese, they're like, what is this? What's a main course? We just order lots and lots of dishes, Exactly. Right? You're better to cut up the steak and have everyone share it because yeah. they'd love to try the, the Aussie Wagyu beef. That's mm, still on mm. the list of things to try, but they don't want a 250-gram portion. Just going back to some of your current initiatives, I remember growing up, you know, I might be giving it away in the 60s, 70s, where we would camp by the beach and have a very, very relaxed holiday. Now, now, when Aussies travel overseas, they might even do a tour or do something jam-packed or maybe they go to relax. Um, but there's been a bit of a resurgence in um, camping. Absolutely. And the campgrounds, are, don't even want to call them campgrounds nowadays. Okay. Many of them are actually holiday parks. The quality of the domestic Australian product in terms of holiday parks is fabulous. There are a lot of places that have invested in villas rather than cabins okay. that are actually four or five star. There are three bedrooms. You have full cooking facilities. They, they look as good, if not better, than any brand new hotel. And then you get the added benefit. They've got great big water parks for the kids. They're often on a beach location. Yep, yep. They're in some of the best locations around Australia, they're almost a destination in their own right. In their own right, yeah. yeah. So rather than going to some big, you know, swanky resort, go to a holiday park. Going from your hotel to your dining room. Um, Because one of the advantages, talking earlier about, you know, integrating and meeting the locals, I mean, that's one of the attractions of these kind of uh, holiday parks, isn't it? That everyone sort of congregates, whether it's around an activity or the barbecue. The sausage sizzle, which yep. is a, a tradition. That, <laughs> and, it, and it should be one that remains. That's absolutely what we want our tourists to come and try, whether they're coming from China or anywhere else in the world. And to get that chance around the campfire to sit and chat to the locals. Because one of the other drivers for the free and independent travellers is they actually say, I want the chance to actually meet a local. When you look at the delegation that you ran, what was the highlight for oh, everybody? Absolutely. It was meeting, meeting the, the locals. locals and sitting down and having a conversation. And language is less and less of a barrier because a lot of young kids out of China speak a fairly passable or good level of English. Mm-hmm. So you tell me about this tour that you um, have put together. You're, you're trying to attract people in that holiday park type industry to really get on the ground and you know, go to conferences there, meet locals. Exactly right. So what we want to do is take a, a delegation of people up from the camping and caravan or outdoor adventure industry in Australia to come and see China because we know the numbers are starting. We know that there was 110% growth in the sector of Chinese visitors staying overnight in Australia in campgrounds last year. So we need to be ready. We need to provide the best level of service to them as possible so that we develop a really good reputation for this. And one way to do it is like we talked about before, getting to know people. So the delegation is going to Shanghai because that's the biggest city where they're emanating from. Uh, Then on to Suzhou to see a second tier tourism city in China. And finally, we end up in Beijing um, at the Camping and Caravan Expo that's being held and then heading out to a campground or they call them RV parks. They've been very influenced by the Americans and out to the Great Wall because if you don't tr- uh, climb the Great, Great Wall, Wall, you're yeah. not a plucky Chinese. Yeah, absolutely. So, so people are actually you know, doing that sort of camping, caravanning in China now. It's growing. So in 2010, there were no campgrounds. There wow. are about 450 or 500 operational ones now with another 400 under construction. And the Chinese government has said that by 2020, there will be 2,000. So outside of Beijing, within a two to three hour radius, there's 20 27 campgrounds at the moment so the Beijing locals can get a weekend away and get a feel for being out in nature fantastic and then of course with them coming here we'll need to provide all of the equipment so that's lots of opportunities for um, businesses and small businesses around Australia car rentals motorhome rentals um, 
food locations along the way, getting the provenance of buying the seafood on their way back to the cabin where they're going to cook it themselves. Yeah. Um, so there's a whole range of opportunities. They're learning to surf or they're learning to swim when they're yeah. coming out to our coastal and that's areas. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Stand up paddle boarding. There's a whole range of different activities depending on the age group, depending on their interests that they're coming out here and doing. So tourism's no longer just those who see themselves in the tourism industry. It's all the indirect um, businesses as well, your butcher, your baker, all the others. That and it's not just in the um, capital cities. It's also in regional areas, which it's is growing. where we're also encouraging migration. So once they start to come here, they love Australia, they want their kids educated, then they need a whole lot of services, whether it's um, those holiday or you know living services to financial and other services. Exactly so, right. Yeah. Research recently showed that Chinese tourists are the highest propensity out of all tourism groups that we get to actually re-engage with the country. So they buy our produce when they go back home, yep. so it's a much higher level. But also when they come out here, while they're here on holiday, exactly like you say, Stacey, they're actually looking, could I send my child here yes. for school? Could I buy property? Should I invest here? Should I retire here? Should I send my parents to retire here or have medical tourism? Um, all those areas are off the back of the tourism industry. And it's a great opportunity for uh, people like myself in the uh, financial and professional services uh, networks to collaborate with someone like yourself. So that's been terrific. And education as well. Oh, look, yeah. the education market. So um, just to uh, finish, what would be your top three tips for our SME listeners uh, in terms of um, tapping into this market and, and what they need to consider? Well, the first thing I'd like to say, Stacey, is that the Chinese market is rapidly changing. It's a diverse, sophisticated market. So you really do need to get a deep understanding. And, and as we've both said, the best way you can do that is actually yeah, to get go on the ground, over, yeah. get on yeah. the ground to understand it. Because you can read as much as you can read, <laughs> but until you see it, it doesn't make sense. And it sense. really opens your eyes getting there, absolutely. And Hugely. it's not like people who say, yeah, I've been to Asia, Bali doesn't really count. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly right. Um, next one is you really need to develop a well-thought-out strategy for for engagement. I know a lot of people say, oh, just get on WeChat and they shall come. Well, it's not quite that simple and getting organic growth on WeChat is a whole other conversation yeah, yeah. for one day. So it really is, there are a whole range of marketing channels. You need to be as sophisticated with the Chinese market as you do with the domestic market. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the third one is cultural nuances can make or break opportunities. So that cut through that I talked about before with the poplars and people seeing them, and oh, sorry, Simon seeing yeah, them yeah, and saying yeah. that would appeal. Those types of cultural nuances you need somebody who's an expert in the industry who knows your industry but is also knowledgeable about China to really give you the insights because brands can get it so wrong <laughs> and we've seen lots of examples of that over the years for, for early adopters but I mean I guess you've been there right from the start as the uh, China has evolved uh, or modernized absolutely over the last 30 years so some great insights Andrea. I remember Shenzhen when it was still a pa rice paddy <laughs> Now, an innovation hub. So, um, exactly. I'm Stacey Martin, uh, and you've been listening to the Oz Asia Business Program, and Andrea Palatsky from Amplify Me, a uh, focus on tourism consulting. You can find out about that uh, upcoming mission on the uh, website. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening to the Oz Asia Business Program with our host, Stacey Martin, our Asian business specialist and expat financial advisor. Powered by Eagle Waves Radio and broadcasting proudly from Vivo Cafe, Sydney.